teníamos nada Solo el polvo de la tierra Y hace eso nos quitaron Nos robaron, nos humillaron Nos obligaron a regalar la patria Hasta la lengua de la boca nos arrancaron ¿Qué más podrían quitarnos? No teníamos nada Solo el sudor de la espalda del de día El dolor del trabajo de nuestra vida Nuestras lágrimas caían al suelo Nuestros ojos buscaban algo nuevo Nuestras almas rogaban al cielo Cuando cambiará, cuando cambiará
Thank you, Hector. This, this, I'm trying to get the PowerPoint here, so give me just a second and then I will formally introduce there. You can see my screen? Here we go. That was Hector Urarte, everybody. Uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hector, for joining us. This is the Seen and Unseen Youth Platica. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, singing our way to freedom. I'm very excited. We have guest panelists today. We have the writer-producer. Um, Hector, uh, thank you so much. Do you want to just uh, uh, give us just a brief little quick introduce yourself? So basically, my name is uh, Hector Riarte Jr. Um, and uh, my stage name is Pachango. Um, I've been writing since I was 13 years old. Uh, started off writing Christian music and then became, uh, started writing uh, secular music and, you know, a lot of uh, cultural Chicano music. Um, and I, I look, I look up to and idolize uh, everything that all my uh, uh, past Chicano artists have done. This is a, a great moment for, for all of us. Excellent. Thank you so much for bringing your music. We like to start with a little bit of music here. And uh, this is part of a larger project, The Seen and Unseen, Ricardo uh, Favela Expressions of Chicano Art. If you have not had a chance to see the show, it's on for one more week. So Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, actually three days to be able to see the show. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, Guspo, uh, Justin, to add in the chat uh, the phone number that you need to call so that you can make an appointment and wear your mask to come see the show. Uh, we have some wonderful um, uh, platicas that are available uh, on Facebook, so he'll put that in there as well. So it's just a beautiful, beautiful exhibit of Ricardo Favela's work. Um, so this is uh, just an extension of, of the, the Chicano project, which is really talking about Chicanos and what, what is Chicano art. And also want you to save the date. Our very last platica for this season will be on the 29th of April, and it'll be the voices of RCAF because we have some of the, the old guard that are going to come and have a nice little chat with Eddie Salas. We'll be hosting that, and that will be next Thursday, the 29th uh, at 7 p.m. And you can get through at Facebook. And again, we always wanted to thank our sponsors. Uh, this particular uh, event today is sponsored by Puente and the Hill Project and the Redwood High School Multicultural Appreciation uh, Club. And we will have some of those members here with us today on our panel joining us. So I'm very excited. I'm hoping that you all got a chance to see the film. Also, if you have not seen the film yet, we still have until April 30th to screen that film. So again, our wonderful tech guy is going to put in the chat the number, the address that you need to be able to register uh, yourself. And then we will send you the link and you can watch at 24 seven until April 30th to be able to watch this film. So I'm going to have the students uh, as they come on, introduce themselves and tell us just a little bit about who you are because I really, we could spend all day talking about these incredible students, guys. I'm, I'm just so uh, uh, honored to have them join us today, but we'll go ahead and we're just gonna go in the order that they happen to be listed here. And just please tell us, introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit about what you thought about the film. Neftali, you wanna go first, please? 
Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Neftali Gonzalez. I'm a senior at Redwood High School. I'm also the co-founder of the Redwood High School Multicultural Appreciation Club, and I'm currently a youth intern for the HEAL Coalition. And my first impression of the film while watching it was I got to, you know, hear the stories of young people who found the courage to fight the self-determination and justice, you know, here in California, and um, people who were ready to challenge the world through the art of music. Excellent, thank you, Javier. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Xavier Martinez. I'm also a senior at Redwood High School and a co-founder co um, of RHS's Multicultural Appreciation Club with my good friend, Neftali here. And um, for my uh, general impression of the film, first and foremost, I wanna to say to Paul that the film was just incredible. Um, before watching this movie, I hadn't really been exposed to Chicano music growing up as a kid. Um, but after watching it, I gained so much, not only on the music, Chicano music as a whole, but on the movement itself. And um, as for myself, I was able to connect um, a lot of the songs to my family's background and, you know, um, their upbringings and uh, just being able to hear and learn about Chunky's life and uh, the impact that he left was just amazing as a whole. So thank you. Thank you. Asab? Hi, my name is Asab Alaluddin. I'm also a senior at Edward High School and a member of the RHS Multicultural Appreci Appreciation Club. Um, for my general impressions of the film, I thought it was, a, it was a pretty amazing film. I hadn't really heard of Chunky Ora's music before then, and it was really interesting to see like his music and how he dedicated his life pretty much to the Chicano movement and how he affected so many lives. Thank you. Sophia. Hi, my name is Sophia also a senior attending Redwood High School. I am a former member of Central Advocacy, also known as CDA, which is a student-run activist program here in West Australia. And um, before watching this film, first of all, I want to say that it was breathtaking to watch. Um, I wasn't aware, I was aware that you kind of no idea the incredible amount of impact that music had um, inflicted on the teams. Okay, thank you, Sophia. You're, you came in and out a little bit, but I heard that you were part of the Central Valley Advocacy. Yes. And I don't know, maybe, yeah. the, maybe the next time I'll have you touch your video off just so while you speak so that we can hear you a little bit better. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Cam Camriel, where are you? I can't see you. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Camriel Ortiz. I am a junior at Golden West High School. I am a part of the Student Inclusivity Task Force. I spearheaded this this last year. Um, when I first watched the movie, I was really impressed. Um, my grandparents had exposed me to some of the Chicano culture, but never been in depth and really gotten to see the history and how it began and how um, it just made accomplishments and improved. And what really took me by storm was that um, the activism didn't begin because it was the trend to be an activist it was more it started in community and then built from there so that's what I took it from the most yeah that's that's really a a, a, a great observation there so did, did you guys watch with your families or did you watch with your friends did you watch it alone does anybody have any feedback with maybe the people they watched with and we don't have to go in any order here but remember I can't see everybody so let's let's just have a little talk here let's have a little chat Sophia, are you talking? Because you're on mute. Can you hear me? Sorry, my video is being weird. Okay. Um, I actually watched this um, separately at first, and then I watched a little bit of it with my family. And overall, it was just an amazing experience to not only watch it by yourself, but to have your family share the same um, reactions that I might have shared when watching it beforehand. So, so you're not the only one. <laughs> and Did anybody else have a chance to watch it with their family? I also got to watch it with my family. And for us, it was just really, you know, cool to see like the whole storyline and, you know, the Chicana Park, which was in San Diego, because my family has been able to visit and travel. And for us, you know, our culture and our history and music has always been a really big part of, you know, my family because my grandparents play a lot of music in choirs and stuff. So being able to watch that with my siblings and my parents, like understanding the power and the movement that music can really have on people when, um, trying to share a story and trying to start a movement. Great. And the whole the whole 
think you really saw how strong the community came together there. So I was just wondering if everybody, and we're all in quarantine. <laughs> we haven't seen, some of us haven't seen our family in a while, but I know that things are loosening up. And, and as we get to see our families a little more, I was just wondering if anybody had had the opportunity uh, to, see, to watch with anybody else. You guys, uh, sirs, did you guys watch with anybody? Or you guys watched it solo? Oh, I did watch it with my um, family. I did watch it with my little brother. We were about a year apart, and his reaction was actually the most interesting to me. Um, he was like, sis, I didn't even know this is actually a thing. I didn't know this is how it came up. I just figured, oh, they write songs. That's how it is. And I was like, no, like there's actually stories behind each song. There's meaning. And he was just really intrigued that people from our same background were able to be successful and able to be given accomplishments and awards for simply sharing their story. So he was really interested in that. Great, thank you. And then and then hopefully we'll have a chance to let Hector do another commercial because he is a songwriter and hopefully he's coming up, we're gonna be able to put together something that you could actually go to a class to learn how to write some songs that are protest songs and advocacy songs because yeah, there is meaning behind uh, all of that stuff. But I, I, I don't wanna get ahead of myself. I'm sorry, uh, Javier, were you gonna talk when you got cut off there? Yeah, I was in Seattle um, after watching the film uh, for my second time. We were both interested in my brother actually part. He, he was interested enough to um, start doing some research on the movement as well and uh, the music. And he was looking at a couple of videos after the film. Um, he was very interested and enjoyed the movie. Uh, we didn't hear who it was you were talking about. Oh, my brother about the same age as me. I'm sorry, your friend, your brother? I didn't hear. My brother. We're able oh, to your, your brother. brother. Okay. So your brother. So people were interested. Uh -huh. yes, yes. Good. Uh -huh. And, and a, a sub. I know I keep getting your name wrong. One of these days I'm going to get it right. I'm going to keep practicing. Uh, no, unfortunately, I just watched it by myself, but I still thought it was really interesting and impactful, the film. Good. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Okay, um, any, anything, I, I, before we go on, I just, I don't wanna forget, uh, um, Paul, the way that you guys were able to translate things and it wasn't super imposed, but it was a very accurate, it was just a beautiful translation. I wanted to bring that point up uh, before I forgot, cause I didn't want to forget that, but just a great job. Do you guys have anything else to talk about your, anything else that really uh, hit you or that was most memorable or that was surprising with the film before we move on and talk and, and address uh, Paul and give him a chance? Okay, again, I can't see all of you, but I'm going to say no. So Paul, well, let me, oh, now we can move on here. If I can figure out how to use this computer and I can move my slides. There we go. We're going to go ahead and introduce uh, Paul Espinosa, who is the writer, the producer, and the director of this wonderful film. Paul, we are so happy that you were able to, to join us today. And what, three years now, I've been trying to get you to come to Visalia. <laughs> and then we had a pandemic, and we still got you to come here locally and to be able to, 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 to meet our, our students and to talk to our community. Please tell us, tell us, talk to us. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lucia. So really glad to be here. As you, as you said, Essentially, this is something we planned uh, quite a few years ago. I think we, I, I met you at a screening we did in, in Fresno, a uh, wonderful screening we had in Fresno and, and definitely wanted to bring the film to, uh, to Visalia. Uh, Lucia uh, may have, didn't mention, but her brother Miguel Vasquez, a very talented musician is also in the film and unfortunately wasn't able to be with us today. But uh, I knew that Visalia would be a fantastic place to be showing the film. So I'm really glad that uh, we were able to do it. And my thanks to all the folks that worked to make this happen today to the, the Visalia Art Center and all the students who participated, as well as the students who, uh, who took a look at the film. I really appreciate that. Uh, no, it's been this, as, as uh, I've said before, this was a real labor of love to make this film. Uh, Chunky was somebody that was just, to me, somebody that I met many years ago when I first came to San Diego and somebody that I really felt um, was just an incredible person, very generous person. A uh, person who really, I guess, exemplified in so many ways, you know, uh, building community in whatever way he could. And I'm very uh, delighted that I was able to, you know, spend some time, you know, telling his story. I think, um, as many of the students have said, uh, this this story and the larger picture of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement is something that uh, so many of them don't, people don't know very much about. 
uh, that, that's sort of a sad reflection on the, the educational system that we have that unfortunately uh, we don't we don't learn uh, very much about this. In fact, even sadder when you think about Visalia being in the Central Valley and so many so much of the uh, Chicano uh, civil rights movement, particularly obviously the the farm worker movement, you know, comes out of the Central Valley. But you know, this story and stories like this really have not you know made their way into the curriculum yet. But hopefully that will happen as more people you know demand that these stories be told. Um, this film really was some, as I said earlier, I, I met Chunky, uh, really, I've been in San Diego since the late seventies. I'm originally from New Mexico. I grew up in New Mexico, uh, but came to California in the, in the early seventies uh, to the Bay area and then uh, came down to San Diego and started basically making films in San Diego. And Chunky was one of the, uh, one of the people I met very early on. And uh, I was basically making films about the Chicano, Latino, Mexican American community uh, since since the late seventies, and of course our paths crossed repeatedly. And um, that chunky, I had chunky uh, score music for several of my earlier films. But I always wanted to do something a little more ambitious in terms of chunky and his story. And uh, thankfully, was able to do that. I think that um, I think chunky really represented so many uh, of the really positive things about about the Chicano movement of of sort of uh, sacrificing for others and giving to the community. Uh, hopefully. Uh, the students in watching this story, they see, you know, a lot of the story is about Chunky as a young person, really the same age as some of the students that we have here with us today. And, you know, he was, you know, came out of a very uh, rural background in Blythe, California, uh, a community that really uh, faced a lot of discrimination. Me Mexican Americans faced a great deal of discrimination there. And I think that he, he certainly had, um, you know, lots of decisions to make and, and certainly, you know, but really wanted to, I guess, in a sense, do something with his skills. And he was able to, you know, dedicate himself. You see that that kind of an important scene in the film where uh, Chunky overhears the, 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 the owner of the ranch talking to his father and, and his, he tells his father that, you know, someday when you're not here anymore, uh, Chunky's father was the foreman on the ranch. Uh, he tells Chunky's father, when you're not here anymore, Chunky, uh, Ramon, I mean, Chunky, uh, will make a great foreman. And Chunky said, wow, he says, you know, they already got my whole life planned. I got to get out of here. So I think that was like a definitely a pivotal moment. And also something that really, you know, kind of represents the kind of person that Chunky was. He was really somebody that was, you know, I guess, adventuresome and, and looking for new experiences, wanted to, I guess, understand the world. And I think he was also you know, very, uh, very uh, dedicated to them trying to use the skills that he was able to develop to, to, to make a difference in the world. And I think obviously, I, I think he did, uh, he did that. He was able to, you know, use the music and, and art uh, to, to really, um, you know, empower his community in a lot of ways. So, uh, like I say, I'm very, uh, very appreciative for, for being able to make the film and also to be able to show it to uh, some some young people here in in, uh, in Visalia. Great, thank you. We're going to go ahead and open it up for uh, uh, questions in just a second. But you know, Paul, I haven't had the chance to even sit here and read through your your um, your bio, and I just realized that you are Dr. Espinosa, and and um, I, I have this is one of my this is one of my things is that I feel that students should be able to turn around and see Dr. Espinosa and Dr. Vasquez and Dr. Whoever and make it a norm. So I'm gonna ask you to please let, let people know that and, and use the doctor. And I will, I apologize that I did not read this earlier and have the Dr. Vasquez, the Dr. Espinosa there for you because I think we're not seen enough. This is the seen and unseen. And I think all these students need to be able to see that it's within their reach. And the more of us that they can see have gone there uh, it's going to be easier for them. When 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 Chunky said that 68 people had Spanish surnames out of 20,000, that was incredible to me. And I think that we have moved a long way, but still, I understand why you do that. And I know at 10 people that I give them the same lecture <laughs> because they just don't use it. They don't want to put, you know, levantar su cuello. But I just think it's so important for our youth to be able to know that they can make it. So... Anyway, I'm off my soapbox, but I just had to, uh, congratulations, Dr. Spinoza, and I will be using that from now on. Students, do you have any questions for our wonderful guest here, Dr. Spinoza, and about his film or his experience? 
I wanted to say, you know, thank you so much for agreeing, you know, planning with us and meeting with us to talk about this film and going into that. Uh, one of the questions that I had for you was during your time with the film, did you have a certain part of the storyline that was your favorite to film or put together? And why, or if you didn't, why not? Well, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you, Neftali. Um, I think that, uh, well, again, this was like a very uh, long uh, gestation for this film, uh, which is actually true for a lot of documentary films. Um, I, uh, as I said earlier, I met, I knew Chunky really for many, many years and definitely admired him. And of course, early on, wasn't necessarily thinking of doing a film on him. Actually, I did, you know, in the film, we see a certain point where the where the band is playing to a live audience and in a studio, and that's a that's a show that I did with Chunky and his band uh, back in the early '90s because I, I felt it was really important to try to capture you know his performances, but um, but like I say, I wasn't sure you know exactly what I could do. But one of the things that I decided to do, really um, long before I actually made the film, was I, I decided to sit Chunky down and do a very extended uh, interview with him, kind of an oral history interview, and just basically capture his story. And that interview basically became the spine of the film, the, the, the audio from that interview and some of what we see when we see Chunky there in, in the film, that's from that interview that I did. Uh, really actually before I had even, you know, was planning to do a film, I just felt like it was really important to, to you know, capture his story, uh, at least on film. And then quite a few years later, I came back and said, you know, I really want to do something more significant, and then spent quite a bit of time trying to um, make the film and raise the money for the film. We did two two uh, Kickstarter uh, campaigns. This is a crowdfunding campaign to try to raise the money, and ultimately were successful and and were able to 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 finish the film. But I think that um, you know, I don't know if I would say I have a favorite part. I think there were you know, Chunky actually is almost the same age as me, uh, and he comes he he. He came from a family of, um, he had one older sister and two younger brothers, and I have one older sister and three younger brothers. He, he's born like a year uh, a year apart from me. And even though I, I grew up in Albuquerque and our experiences are were a little bit different, I grew up in more of an urban environment. And of course, New Mexico is, I think, pretty different from Blythe, California. But there were certain interesting parallels in terms of our lives and the, the importance of our of family to to us and, and that kind of thing. So I think that there were there were ways in which Chunky's story kind of there were there were certain parallels. One of the interesting parallels, uh, you know, I think that one thing that I thought was very important uh, that was part of Chunky's story was you know going to Mexico in the early '70s. He went to Mexico City in 1973, and of course Chunky grew up in the in the border in the border region but actually had never really been in Mexico per se and I think that was that he's like a lot of Mexican Americans of his generation and probably a lot of you know Mexican Americans some of the young people here today who may have Mexican you know uh, Mexican even the children of Mexican immigrants or Mexican origin but ne don't necessarily know Mexico at all so that was a very eye-opening experience for Chunky and then on top of the fact that you know he went to Mexico as he says in the film he saw the pyramids and here he said, you know, he saw this incredible civilization that had been made by, in a sense, you know, his, his ancestors. Uh, and he was just incredibly impressed. He said something like, you know, where have you been all my life, you know, to see these, these, this kind of civilization. But also, uh, just by coincidence, Chunky happened to be in Mexico City right when there was a major uh, musical uh, get together going on of really some of the top musicians of that time. Musicians were very involved in protest music. And we see, you know, Mercedes Sosa is one of them in the film and Gabri uh, Gabino Palomares, Victor Jara, a number of other people that were very, very um, in involved with using music as a vehicle for social justice and social change. And I think that also really resonated with Chunky. I think he, he was already on the path to do that. He had already become part of this La Rondaya that we see in the film. And he was already involved with the United Farm Workers and with Cesar Chavez actually traveling to the Central Valley often to come and, and play for demonstrations and rallies. But then here he goes to Mexico City and again, he gets this, this he sees the value of music, how important music can be in terms of, you know, telling the stories of, of some of the injustices that are going on. So that had a tremendous impact on him. And actually I should say that I wasn't there with Chunky, but I did travel to Latin America at a certain time, also uh, really kind of unknown to me. And it also just opened my eyes so much to uh, some of the other things that were going on in the larger world and some connections that I could make to my own my own background. So I think there were definitely uh, different moments that, that were part of Chunky's life that I could certainly identify with. 
uh, and you know felt you know I could and, and, and really when you see the film you realize that it's it's sort of central to it is Chunky's story but there's also a larger history that he's a part of I certainly think you know see and other people can identify with this what happened the Chicano civil the, the Chicano yeah. civil rights movement how it unfolded in various places but there are certain commonalities in terms of well first off the power of young people which you know all of so many of you are the power of young people the fact that young people said you know we're we're going to make a difference in the world. We're not going to. We're not going to put up with the things that uh, have happened to our previous generations. We we want a different kind of world than the world that we see around us. And they were really in the vanguard of that of that of those changes, as as young people often are. As I, I'm sure many of the young people here today are part of the the really important changes that have to happen in our world. So those are you know among the things that I think really I reflect on when I think about the film. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh, one of the things that Chunky was saying about uh, taking his, his burrito and hiding, that's one of the things that we see commonly in Chicano literature and in Chicano history, where now I know students that will make their burritos and go sell them for breakfast, you know, because now people want them. But back in the day, to be able to have a sandwich and something that everybody else had was a big deal. And you hid your little taco. Uh, and you see this again and again in literature in some of the films. So you're right, even though being a Chicano, Latino, the Hispanic experience all over is different, that there are certain things of, of shaming and things that we went through. And I think you, you did a really nice job of showing that. Uh, Javier, did you have any questions or comments? Yeah, I was going to ask uh, Dr. Espinosa, if there's like any, um, like what was your inspiration to not even, because I know you mentioned you're making films prior to the one you made about Chunky, if there's any experience that like um, I guess like made you think like, you know what, yes, I need to document this, or if there's any inspiration that led you to make these uh, Chicano Latino films. Well, um, yes, I mean, I think that, well, first of all, maybe I should mention that my background is actually in anthropology, not in filmmaking. I, I uh, my, my education was in anthropology. And I think that, uh, I think anthropo anthropology is a really powerful tool for understanding the world. And I certainly encourage anybody who's interested in anthropology to pursue it in whatever way you can. But, um, Working in anthropology, I was also very, very aware of media. I was always trying to find a bridge between anthropology and media. And I think if you were to see uh, more of my films, you'd kind of see a connection between a lot of the work that I've made in terms of films and um, and the anthropology, even though it's sort of you know buried underneath the the, the structure of the film. But um, I think early on, actually going back to my experience in Latin America, I, I did have the opportunity as a as a really as a young person, as a, as a student, as a college student, I sort of made a, found a way to, to do some traveling in Latin America because I was really interested in trying to, I guess, see more of what Latin America was about. But one of the things I was really, uh, in a sense, impressed with or depressed with was the fact that, you know, I would be in different parts of Latin America and what would I see? I, uh, especially in terms of media, I'd see American media. I'd see, I'd see American made, you know, uh, television programs. I'd see American made films, you know, in the theaters and on television, a remarkable amount of product that was made in the United States, I was seeing in Latin America. And that led me to ask the question of like, why is that? And where does all this stuff come from? And how does it get made? And that led me to sort of research that a little bit more. And that's part of what my, my, uh, my doctoral work was on. But essentially, I also became very aware of just how, how, how needed it was for more of our stories to be shown on, on television and on in the movies that there was. And this was, you know, like I say, more than 40 years ago, that we were practically invisible. We being the larger Latino or Mexican origin population, we were practically invisible in terms of television. And I hate to say this, but I think still we are, there's still a great deal of, um, a great deal more that needs to be done. We're just not, we're not, our representation is way below you know what it should be, especially when we consider that we we Latinos are basically uh, the largest uh, movie going group of, of uh, you know population in, in the country, and yet there's there's so we're so underrepresented both in terms of in front of the camera with actors and, and actresses as well as behind the camera the people that are making decisions. So I think one of the things that I felt was this was something that I could do something about that I I learned a little bit about how to make films and felt there was really a. a, a a need and an opportunity for me to basically be able to tell stories about about my community 
And that's basically what I've been able to do. I, I've been in San Diego for most of my professional career with a few exceptions. And most of my films deal with the larger sort of US-Mexico border region, d different stories dealing with you know, the region. Uh, I, I invite any of you to go to uh, espinosaproductions.com. I think uh, Lucia and the people can share that in the chat, espinosaproductions.com. And you can see some of the other work that I've done. But over a 40 year career, I've had the opportunity to make a lot of films. I did a film on uh, the hunt for Pancho Villa about Pancho Villa's raid on Columbus, New Mexico in 1916 and the American expedition that goes after him. That, and we, that's a film that I did in the early 90s. And we interviewed people that were around during that time period. These are people that were already in their 90s. Uh, I've done, I did a film on uh, the war between Mexico and the United States, which is basically how, how the border actually gets constructed at the end of the war, the, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that basically constructed the border. So I really, you know, feel like I've had an opportunity to make a lot of work and also continually am reminded of the need for more of this work. And I certainly hope that some of you uh, watching or uh, attending today will think about uh, media filmmaking and media making and uh, just representation as something that's really uh, that you can get get involved in and really make a difference. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, Saab, did you have anything? Yeah, um, I was wondering. Like when you first like set out to like make the film, did you know like originally that you wanted to make a film fully dedicated to Chunky and like his music? Or did you want to like make a more broad film on like Chicano culture and music? And if so, like at what point did you, did you know you wanted to make a film fully dedicated to Chunky? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I, think, I think pretty early on, I decided that the, the focus of the film would be Chunky, but that said, I really felt it was also an opportunity to tell a little bit larger story. And you see that, you know, in, in the film, I mean, clearly it's, it's, it's kind of chunky story, but we, we try to weave in, uh, you know, obviously Chunky's connection to the United Farm Workers, to Cesar Chavez. I mean, here and here Chunky had a very organic connection. He was, he, as we say in the film, Chunky was Cesar Chavez's favorite musician. And so he had a, he had a connection to this larger, uh, this larger uh, world that I think was something that I did want to tell a little bit about. Again, as I said at the very beginning, I, I was already aware, especially since I've been making films for a long time, and also I've had a net chance to show films to young, to both uh, college students and even some high school students. And I'm very aware that, that a lot of these stories are just very unfamiliar, that you don't really get exposed to these stories in the high school or at the, even at the college level. At college, a lot of times that is a top opportunity where a lot of young people you know, do, in fact, they take a Chicano studies course or they take an ethnic studies course or they take a history course or sociology and all of a sudden they learn about their own community for the first time. And a lot of times, many times they're, they're kind of shocked to find out all these things that they, they never learned before. And I think it's a sad reflection basically on our, on our educational system that you know, we, don't, we don't learn more as we're, as we're coming through. But anyway, I, I know that that's really important. And I think that in this film, I certainly wanted to tell a little bit of a larger story. I mean, we, we tell a little bit about you know, this context of what was going on in the you know the larger the 60s and 70s some of the things that chunky was with chunky and other people were, were up against uh some of the other besides chunky the other musical groups like los lobos and other musical groups that were around during that time period they were also you know very dedicated there were you know many many other groups that were really uh in, you know very uh important in terms of the 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 chicano arts collective fact which i should mention you know again we're doing this this uh, exhibition, uh, this exhibition of uh, Ricardo Favela, which is going on right now at the uh, Visalia Art Center, which definitely, if you haven't had a chance to see it, I wish I were in Visalia so I could go see it. But he was really an important artist, and he was part of the the uh, as a, the, the Royal Chicano Air Force, the RCAF, which was uh, founded by both him and uh, Jose Montoya and uh, Esteban Villa in in Sacramento. And uh, and Jose Montoya, who is a very well known poet and, and artist. His brother is Malakias Montoya, and Malakias actually, uh, uh, for, for this film, uh, did a wonderful uh, print. He created a print for us that we used as part of our, our fundraising to try to raise money for the film. Uh, basically, you know, a print that has Chunky in it. Uh, maybe I can share that later with people. But anyway, uh, it's also, it's on my website. I should mention, we also have a website at chunkyfilm.com, chunkyfilm.com. It's kind of in, we're in process of, of um, working, uh, changing some things on it. But anyway, uh, there was a there was a direct connection between you know this film Malakias Montoya Jose Montoya both of whom I knew well and and met all of many of the artists in the RCAF in Sacramento back in 
I don't know, the mid seventies uh, when I was, uh, when I was up in the, in, in Northern California. So anyway, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a, there was always in my mind, a larger story to try to tell, even though I think the narrative was the through line was basically a chunky story. Great. Thank you. Sophia. Hi, I, first of all, I wanted to apologize. I have to have my camera off when I speak because my internet isn't the best. Um, but the one question that I do have, um, as we've seen in the film, music has clearly enacted a drastic impact on many social justice movements, specifically the Chicano movement. Um, what advice would you give current Chicano activists, or I guess just activists in general, who are trying to incorporate music into their work? Yes, well, thank you. Thank you, Sophia, for that question. And thank you for, uh, I know we had, you had the problem with the, with the audio, so that's great. I was able to get your question fine, so thank you. Well, I think one of the things that you can see from the film is basically how important music is to social movements. I think that music is so powerful. You know, music is something that speaks not just to our, our it speaks both to our hearts and minds and our, and our souls. And I think that you can see that um, one of the things that I, one of the people, one of the interviewees says that, that uh, Cesar, Cesar Chavez would never let people talk for too long before he'd bring, you know, music back. That music, he knew music was very, very important in terms of, you know, keeping people connected. And I think certainly today, you know, there's so many uh, good examples of young musicians, young Latino musicians, I think, that are really uh, doing fantastic work. I mean, I think, um, actually, I should mention that uh, this film that you just saw, of course, Chunky and, and Chunky's music is very central to the film, but the film also has a score, and the score was done by Quetzal Flores. Quetzal Flores is the, um, uh, he has the band Quetzal that maybe some of you know of. Quetzal is a band from East Los Angeles that's been around for, for many years, and uh, just a wonderful uh, musical group uh, with uh, Quetzal Flores and his partner, Martha Gonzalez. Uh, but Quetzal did a fantastic score. I mean, if, if you have a chance to, to see the film again, or if you haven't seen it, check it out. Think about the music that you're hearing sometimes when you're not hearing music from the time period, and you'll see how, how critical uh, music is, the score is to the, sto the storytelling, you know, carrying us from one scene to the next. And, you know, Quetzal did a fantastic group, fantastic job. But like Quetzal and other group, also Motley, uh, Las Cafeteras, um, you know, uh, many, many other groups that uh, are in a sense kind of uh, carrying on the legacy of, of Chunky and, and musicians from that time. Hector, and let me just thank Hector for the fantastic music he played at the beginning and the importance of, of music. And I think certainly if I were, you know, a young musician uh, today, I would, I would definitely try to, you know, use my music in the, in the, in the broader, you know, social justice movement. Uh, there's always, you know, a gathering. Of course, we haven't had so many gatherings because of COVID, but we're, I think we're nearing the end of that. And certainly I think by, by the fall and next year, we're going to be seeing, we're definitely going to be a lot more free to get together. And of course, everybody's going to be so happy to, to get together. And I think we're going to see that, that music can be such a powerful tool for, you know, bringing us together, for celebrating community, for building community. So I would definitely say, you know, use those skills because they're, they're very desperately needed in, in the kind of uh, uh, social justice uh, efforts that we, that we need to do as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Camriel, did you have a question for Paul? Yes, um, I could just offer right off the bat, I could totally tell you're so truly passionate and it's just really appreciative, especially coming from someone at a younger age and just knowing that it's really being impacted on all on all aspects. But the question I had was um, actually a clip of the movie, the cartoon about um, the new student that was um, definitely caught me off guard. It surprised me and my brother as well but it was a different kind of format than the rest of the movie. The rest of the movie was um, more so like real actual factual pictures, um, different um, icons, social activists, but you did choose to include that. So I was just wondering why you decided that that clip would be so important to include in the introduction of the movie. Yeah, well, thank you for that question. That's a great question. I think, well, let me just back up a little bit. One of the challenges in making a film like this and, and a lot of other films that I've made, which are basically dealing with the with Latino history, uh, Mexican American history, Chicano history, is that the documentation that exists, the larger documentation that exists, a lot of times is so um, just not there. I mean, certainly there's been a lot more documentation of other of other movements. And, and in our case, for maybe a variety of reasons, there's just not as much documentation. So when you go out there to try to make a movie, a, a historical movie, a documentary, like some of the films that I've made, 
really have to be inventive about what you're going to show. Of course, in a movie, you've got to be showing something. Clearly, we had, you know, many, many interviews with people that we talked to. But of course, you know, when we're doing interviews, we know that sometimes we're not going to be staying on the interview the whole time. We're going to go to something different. So one of the things you're always faced with is what other kinds of visuals can you find? In this particular case, obviously, we were able to find you know, quite a bit of archival uh, film, uh, a film that we could use to talk about, you know, the United Farm Workers and the whole larger period of what was going on in this earlier period, but really not as much as you would like. If some of you have seen other documentary films, let's say about, I don't know, uh, other things from, uh, from an earlier period, you realize that there's sometimes a lot of material to choose from. And in our case, there's really not as much as, as I would like to so say as a documentary filmmaker. So in the case of, of this film, there were a number of little stories that that we had that I definitely wanted to tell, but we had to really be kind of inventive to figure out how we were going to, what we were going to be showing. And besides the, the Facundo Gonzalez story that you're mentioning, there's a, there's a number of other small little, um, you know, animation pieces that were, that we, that we created. In fact, I should, I should really uh, mention, you know, uh, my associate producer, Evan Apodaca, a young, a young uh, Chicano filmmaker who worked with me on the film and actually did uh, the, those little animations that you see in the film, did a fantastic job of animating uh, some of the photographs and just basically bringing some of those little stories to life. In the case of the Facundo Gonzalez story, that's a little bit of a different um, example. Uh, Chunky, uh, Chunky, when I, when I interviewed Chunky, he told me the story. And of course, it's a great, it's a great story. And, and Chunky actually was, you know, just a fantastic storyteller. And in fact, I heard him tell that story on more than one occasion. But one of the things that I discovered was that he had also uh, to told the same story to StoryCorps. I don't know if any of you know about StoryCorps, but StoryCorps is a, a larger project to basically create uh, oral history about different people uh, in, in the United States. And sometimes if any of you hear uh, National Public Radio, you'll hear pieces of a, just an interview between two people about whatever. Anyway, StoryCorps had done a, a, an interview with Chunky quite a few years ago. And then they decided that they were gonna take a few of these, uh, basically what are radio interviews and animate them. And one of the stories that they decided to animate was Chunky's story of Facundo Gonzalez. And so they did that. In fact, if you go to, if actually, if you, if you Google Facundo Gonzalez, that you'll you'll find that animation, and of course this was a very um, highly produced piece. They they did a fantastic job. It was several you know animators actually from Los Angeles who did this particular one, as well as many other pieces for StoryCorps. But anyway, I I knew about this piece, and I really you know basically wanted to include it in the film. I did have it was kind of a challenge to actually to get to them to be able to get to StoryCorps and to then get them to agree to to let me use it. But I, you know, was able to convince them, explain, you know, what I was trying to do. This wasn't really a, a commercial film per se. And I just felt, you know, that the way that they did the animation was just so, so effective and so well done. And then actually also speaking to your question, I thought it was also really important. I wanted to get uh, something like that early in the film. I thought that one of the things that was so important about Chunky was his use of humor. Chunky used humor so, so effectively. When he was on the stage, he was constantly you know, joking with the audience. And it was just part of his whole, you know, his, his shtick basically. And it was one of the things that I think made him extremely effective as a storyteller was his use of humor. So for me, in terms of telling his story, I wanted to get humor into the film really early on. And that was sort of early in his, you know, the film is basically chronological in terms of Chunky's life. So more, more or less, I felt like that would be a really effective way to sort of tell part of the story of Chunky Part of the story of identity, the way in which identity is sometimes, you know, taken away from you, but also use humor, hopefully very effectively. And of course, it's just a, it's such a fantastic, you know, animation. So it's something people always respond to effectively. But anyway, thank you for that that great uh, question, uh, uh, Gabriel. Yes, th thank you. And thank you, Paul. I want to go ahead and just show just a little clip. Uh, and then we've got a comment that goes really well with that. So I'm going to... Uh, I'm on somebody else's computer, guys, so bear with me. I'm going to stop share, and we're going to go ahead and let our Zoom master pick up and show us a little clip. Chicanos created their own their own space, our own identity, and, and I uh, the third space, as it's referred to, is primarily because we didn't fit anywhere. You know, you don't quite fit in Mexico. You don't quite fit over here. We go to Mexico, we're pochos, we're gringos. We're in the United States, we can be here 10 generations, we're still Mexicans. You know, go back to where you came from.
So we said, okay, what do we do now? We create our own space. So that's, that's where Chunky fits, you know. Chicanos were experiencing discrimination on many fronts. Besides being denied basic human rights in the United States, some Mexicans saw us as traitors to their country. We found ourselves caught in the middle between two societies that simultaneously rejected us. Because some of us no longer spoke fluent Spanish, some Mexicans saw us as not Mexican enough. They called us pochos. Pocho! I knew I was Mexican. I looked Mexican. But why did I have trouble speaking Spanish? Pocho! All the confusion aroused the curiosity in me. I began to question the implications of the word. Pocho! Does the label really fit me? Maybe it does. And if it does, is it my fault? Pochismo. The culture of pochismo was very prevalent in you. I remember my mother correcting me many times. No hables así, you know. Estás hablando como pachuco, you know. When I would say the word, ese, orale, or something, you know. You're always being corrected about the way you weren't speaking. You weren't speaking properly. You weren't speaking right. What the hell? Well, what is the right language, man? You know what I mean? Pocho. I began to realize that I had absorbed the strengths of two cultures and lifestyles. Was that good or bad? Pocho. Good, you know. I have an innovative way of expressing myself that relates to both sides of the border. Pocho. What will it be today? Tacos or hamburgers? Pedro Infante or the Rolling Stones? I got tears in my eyes the first time I heard that. It was tough. I didn't speak English until I started school. And I didn't realize that anybody else understood what I went through as much as, as obviously Chunky did and, and a whole shitload of us did. But that song brings it out. And in our third space, right here in the middle, we are Chicanos. And here is a place where we're safe, where we know who we are. We know where we come from. We know where we want to go. And it doesn't matter what the other two spaces think of us because this is our place. This is our land. You know what? I am a pocho. A proud pocho. Proud because I have survived cultural denials and attacks on my soul. Pocho. Simon que yes. Soy Ramon Sanchez. But better known as Chunky. A little bit of that and a little bit of this. That's who I am. One badass pocho. Quítate before I get mad and say. Yo soy chicano, tengo color, puro chicano, hermano con honor. Cuando me dicen que hay revolución, defiendo a mi raza con mucho valor. Tengo mi orgullo, yo tengo mi fe. Soy diferente, soy color café. Tengo cultura, tengo corazón y no me lo quita. Thank you. Thank you, Zoom Master. Let me see if I can go back to my PowerPoint. If not, we can do without it. Okay. Can you see my PowerPoint? Not okay. yet. Not yet. Okay. I'm learning. I think I have to screen share again. And, but actually, um, I think what I'd rather do is just see you guys. So I am going to try not to share. Oh, my be whatever. Oop. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. I, re I really kind of wanted to see your faces, but <laughs> um, I did forget, and I usually always uh, put in, ask people to make their comments in the chat. Feel free to share. Uh, and if you have any questions uh, for Paul or for the panelists to also put those in the Q&A, we will have a chance for Q&A later. But we did have one comment that I think hits right to the heart of the um, of the clip that we just watched about the uh, Chicano identity. And I'm going to go ahead and ask Zoom Master to, to read that, if you will. Yes. So this comment is coming from Matthew Rangel. 
And the comment is, I am deeply concerned that I was unaware of Chunky until now. His philosophical notion of Chicano as someone who is negotiating their own identity as difficult to define as neither purely Mexican nor purely American, and that a Chicano is not necessarily even someone of Hispanic or Central American, uh, Central American indigenous descent. Was the society that I grew up with that I grew up within oppressing this philosophy for me that would have empowered me more as a child searching for identity? My family was proud to play a role in the UFW back in the days that Cesar Chavez was becoming a national figure, but my parents and grandparents didn't pressure me to define myself that way. I had to discover my own way, but boy, would it have helped if I knew about Chunky when I was a little, when I was a little kid. My dad and both my grandpas played music like Chunky, but I never knew the words because I didn't know Spanish, know the Spanish language fluently. I cried when I heard Chunky perform Pocho in the film. It ruptured me down to my bones. Thank you, uh, Zoom Master James, and thank you, uh, Matthew Rangel. And for those of you from the union, uh, Matthew Rangel is a grandson of Eugenio Rangel, who worked uh, very closely with my father and worked with the UFW uh, for many years. Uh, uh, students, do you have any comments about the, the clip we just saw or about anything else in the movie? But I think that whole idea of Chicano identity, because what, what I found is that uh, the students of your age generally don't, like Matthew was saying, don't have a lot of knowledge of, of being Chicano and having that identity. And, and don't feel we need to go in order here if anybody has something. Should we go backwards this time? Camriel, do you have anything? Um, I think it's really important to like know the realization that you don't have to be on a certain spectrum. Like you don't have to lean more one way than the other. I think it's important that you should express yourself like through generations. Like I know personally, um, my grandparents, I don't think I've ever watched a show in English at their house, but I know when they come over, they'll watch every show with me imaginable. So I know that you should not have to fall upon a certain spectrum, but I do know that it is important to express parts that you are comfortable with and be eager to learn about something new and be eager to um, still share that end. And no matter where you stand on the spectrum, you should be proud of where you do stand. That's great, thank you. Sophia? Uh, I completely agree. It's all about identity and where you believe you belong. It's not necessarily about where people deem you as, sorry, where people think that you belong. As you've seen in this, um, this film, there's been um, people that are stuck in between, the Chicanos are stuck in between, you know, being labeled as Mexican, being labeled as Americans, and there's always been that confusion. And um, I myself, I'm not Mexican, but I, after watching this film, able to not fully understand, I will never be able to understand, but get a good sense of what it's like to have that sort of confusion in terms of self-identification and where you belong in this spectrum. Great, thank you. Asap. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. I never heard the term pocho before. And I found it like really admirable that he just like kind of took that term and a negative connotation and he just kind of ran with it and trying to make it like his own and trying to make it into like more of a positive light. Great, thank you. Javier? Um, I really like this clip myself too. And going back to what Cameron was saying about, it doesn't really matter um, whether it would expect or what certain place you're born at, but rather like, like it's more of a, a state of mind and a state of heart and understanding um, with what Chicano kind of represents. And just, I guess, just being able to just be proud of where you are and where you stand with yourself, it's it's uh, truly memorable. And yeah, that clip, is, it, it is really sad. And hearing it over and over again, it gets me even emotional myself, but um, uh, made me feel, after watching that clip, makes me feel, I guess, just proud of who I am and grateful for my upbringings and my past. Great, thank you. Ms. Tali? Uh, something about this clip, but you know, the film in general was that a lot of these songs, um, despite being like 30 years ago, 20 years ago, they still really kind of hit to the core, whether it's, you know, identification or social justice issues that are going on. And I find that, you know, really empowering, you know, coming from my own family, you know, listening to the different songs that he was singing, you know, being prideful of who you are and where you come from in a world that might not be so welcoming at first, but really, you know, taking that stance of like, you know, I'm here, like I earned this, or, you know, this is also, you know, my land, my community, my society, and really taking, you know, maybe the negative um, connotations of certain, wor certain words and turning it around and, you know, taking control and taking power of those words. Um, and also, you know, inspiring, educating other youth um, to be prideful of that. And something that was also mentioned 
um, you know, in the school system, how we don't really learn about all those things about um, the cultures, not just our own culture, but, you know, other people's culture. And I think that moving forward, um, there's still a lot that needs to be done. However, we're taking, you know, steps to be more inclusive in our education so that everybody can really understand the struggles of not only our people, but of every um, um, uh, community in the United States. Good, thank you. And again, remember that uh, uh, one of our sponsors and some of the students here are from the Multicultural Appreciation Club at Redwood High School. And that's kind of what they work on is to be able to show that diversity. Um, I, I wanna bring up something uh, I've been, I wouldn't say in the middle of, but I've been aware of several conversations between Chicanos that feel, and I'm by Chicano, I mean a male person that self-identifies as Chicano and, and how offended they are sometimes when somebody's bringing up Latinx. Um, and so as, as we want to move forward and understand each other and be inclusive, uh, we understand, well, some of us understand that the idea term of Latinx is so that you're not having to be in one role or another defined by, as male or female by the A and the O. And then the, the Latinx itself brings out a whole bunch of uh, you know, do you, are you Mexican American? Are you from a Latin American country? Are you Rasa? Uh, and because Rasa is usually the the more down home, comfortable, prideful Chicano thing to say. So I, after I saw this clip, I thought, oh, I just, I really, I felt like I got it a little bit clearer why a Chicano would be so offended after they've worked so hard to make this a claim and to be part of the Chicanismo than to have somebody say, oh no, we should all be Latinx now. But I don't really think that that's what Latinx are saying. They're saying, I want to use this term because this fits me. And I think that goes right to what uh, Camarillo was saying is that we have the ability to choose where we fit <laughs> and what we're comfortable with. And I think it's just a matter of really understanding where people are uh, and being able to accept um, you know where people are without feeling like you're you're that everybody has to be Latinx, uh, but that people can feel comfortable with whatever they choose. Any any uh, feedback or comment on that? In any order. Um, just going off what Neftali is saying, um, I did realize like the cor correlation between like then and now, and that not that much has changed today, but we are making great steps towards. Um, inclusivity and it does make me realize that it does take a while to create change but that change is still occurring so that's really encouraging especially someone of my age to know that change is happening and steps are being taken into the right direction great thank you anybody else remember i can't see anybody so if you're raising your hand or you have something Okay, we do have one question in the chat box. Uh, I can't see who it's from, but it says, what are some Latino Chicano films that have inspired you uh, and, and that you think we all should watch? So I'm not sure who this question is for, but uh, anybody wanna take that one? Paul, you wanna go first? Uh, sure, well, you know, I mean, there are so many, so many wonderful films out there. I mean, I. I really was part of a generation, uh, really almost the first generation that uh, was able to start making Chicano films. Of course, I mean, Chicano itself is a is a term that really comes into being in a predominant way in, in the late 60s and early 70s. So, uh, you know, certainly some of the top filmmakers that you can think of, Luis Valdez certainly would be at the top of that list. Luis Valdez, who was part of the, who created the El Teatro Campesino and then, you know, became a, a filmmaker, created many, many wonderful plays and also many films. Zoot Suit is the film that of course comes to mind as well as La Bamba and, and other films, but certainly in the, in the 1980s and into the 90s, there were a number of, you know, very important films that were made by Chicanos and Latinos about, about our community's experience. And I think, you know, uh, many of those films are, are still, still relevant and still actually still being seen, but, um, you know, I think obviously there's a there's a new generation around. I think every every generation is going to work on you know defining themselves in terms of the stories that they're interested in. I certainly think that um, you know there's so many more opportunities now to to be able to make films, both because technology is so much so much cheaper in a way, and there's I don't know there's just more interest. I mean, I'm 
one of the other hats that I wear is I'm on the uh, media arts uh, organization in San Diego that runs the San Diego Latino Film Festival. And we just actually celebrated our, our 28th anniversary. We have an annual festival, which I would certainly encourage uh, anyone to come, come down for. It's usually the third, it's usually in March. And it's a, it's a big affair. Of course, during COVID, we've had a lot of issues, but usually we have, you know, 25,000 people come to the festival over maybe a, a 10 day uh, uh, festival. And it's really a fantastic opportunity to see films from all over Latin America, as well as uh, domestic Latino films made around the United States. And I think that you would see if you go, and there are other festivals that also occur that might be more easier for some of you to get to. But anyway, it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to basically see how much work is being done today. Uh, many, by many, in some cases, very young filmmakers who are just making you know wonderful films about their own experiences. I'm sure there's probably some good examples there in the Central Valley of people that are, are really making great, great films. So, you know, hopefully, um, you know, there'll be a lot to inspire uh, people, uh, especially young people today in terms of films that, that they might want to see as well as films that they might want to make. That's exciting. That's exciting about things that they might want to make. Um, I can think of, uh, there's also the Cine Sin Fin that went for like 20 years and had, uh, uh, would showcase uh, Latino, local Latino artists. So you might want to look that up as well. Um, the, we showed the last Brown Beret two years ago here, even though it was a screening not quite finished yet. And then there's the um, Playing with Fire, I think, is that the Almaraz story? Yes. Almaraz story, that's all well. The, uh, this organization actually, are, this team here, we're going to be showing probably Caesar's Last Fast and uh, No Mas Bebes, I think, are some of the things that are on our list uh, to kind of bring out. Does anybody else, Hector, do you have anything? Or James, is there any, any other films? Are those of you out there, really, please uh, put in the chat any suggestions that you have as well. There's uh, a documentary that, I just watched called The Walkout, which talks about uh, Los Angeles and, and the, the Chicanos that uh, organized the walkout in, in, um, in the school districts um, and the impact that that had. It's very good. Um, yeah, I have that if anybody wants that one. I, I have that on my list, but I didn't mention it right now. Any Anybody else? And James, I don't know, you show probably a few things with Puente when you've been with Puente for a while, if there's anything we forgot. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, films that I've, uh, there's, there, I mean, I, I'm thinking of, uh, uh, I think it's Mari, Mari and Mosquita. That's like a, 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 a film that actually explores like Chicanx identity. Um, and it deals with a, uh, 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 yeah, I think uh, uh, Real Women Have Curves was a play that I think got turned into a movie uh, that is kind of one of my favorites. Uh, y no solo trago la tierra, The Earth Did Not Devour Him, the, based on the Tomás Rivera film. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that. Um, I think then there's all these movies in the 90s, right, that were also made, like Mi Familia, um, um, uh, uh, those, those movies, uh, uh, the uh, Blood In, Blood Out by Jimmy Santiago Baca, right, that explores kind of the, the kind of became a cult classic. Um, yeah, there's, there's been quite a few films, right? I mean, there's, there's, they're, they're definitely out there and you see this sort of growing trend of uh, continuously, right, pushing. And I don't know if also, which I guess I have a question here that just for you, uh, uh, Dr. Espinosa, do you think that some of the digital mediums now, given the fact that now uh, I, I feel like film is a lot more accessible to create, you know, I guess in, because of the digitalization of media, do you think that's gonna uh, push more uh, Chicano Latino filmmakers to be creating? Uh, yes, I, I definitely, definitely think that, uh, you know, basically everybody is walking around with a, with a film camera in their pockets with an iPhone. I mean, an iPhone, the, the kind of quality that you have on an iPhone in terms of video is just fantastic. So, uh, you know, the possibility of creating stuff is just fantastic. Let me just mention that the film you mentioned and the earth did not swallow him is my film. Uh, the adaptation of Tomas Rivera's novel that uh, about growing up as a, a migrant farm worker in, the, in, in South Texas in the 1950s. But anyway, no, I think that the, the, the fact that technology is so much more, so much cheaper, basically, I mean, there's still uh, a lot of work that goes into filmmaking that isn't just, you know, about pulling out your camera and filming something. Although we should remember that we've just been through a fantastic episode in our nation's history where pulling out a film camera has made a huge difference in uh, yeah. in the Derek Chauvin case, you know, where this young woman, the 17 year old girl uh, really made history by filming the, 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 really the assassination of George Floyd. That was done with a, with a, with a, with a camera, with an iPhone by one person who's really, you know, changed, changed, made a significant change in the world. But 
in any case, uh, yeah, I think that the, the accessibility of media and the ability to not only, you know, shoot something with your camera, but then also, you know, edit it on your, on your laptop. I mean, there's just, as I, I was saying earlier, in terms of the Latino Film Fest Festival, we have just an explosion of young, of, of young filmmakers and short films about all kinds of things that are just so, you know, relevant to people's lives. People just talking about the things that are happening in their own lives that, uh, that they're not seeing elsewhere. And I'm sure that many of the people, many of the young people in Visalia could be doing the same things of just talking about things that matter to them and, you know, helping to expose some of those stories to a larger public, really to their own community and to other communities. So I think that's definitely a very positive sign for the future. Great. Any other comments from our panelists? I don't want to. I don't want to call on you. I will put you on the spot, but I'm. I'm going to be patient here. If not, we can. We can move on. Uh, James, do we have any other questions or comments in the, uh, in the Q and A? Uh, no, we don't right now at this time. Okay. So uh, let me just go ahead and take care of some of this business here. Uh, we have uh, because the uh, seen and unseen. Uh, program has been going on for so long. We've had a wonderful partnership with COS and the librarian then has put together a whole bunch of resources to talk about the Royal Chicano Air Force, uh, which is also a lot of place where you could, a lot of a, a, a resource that you can find a lot about the Chicano movement because really the Royal Chicano Air Force really um, uh, contributed a lot to the Chicano movement and really documents it in a just a beautiful, beautiful way. Uh, I will remind you again that we have our last Platica on April 29th, where you actually have members of the RCEF that will be uh, speaking with our host, uh, Eddie Salas. Eddie Salas was the curator for the exam, uh, exam the exhibit. <laughs> I'm thinking exams here. I know finals are coming up. Um, so uh, please uh, join us for, for that as well. Uh, and again, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, we have the Redwood High School Multicultural Appreciation. Uh, we have the Hill Project and the Puente uh, College Sequoias uh, that were for the specific ones. We all kind of share. And uh, again, all of these sponsors have been just really helpful uh, in being able to um, have our project go a little farther. And if anybody is interested, oops, let me stop share here because I want to see these people anyway. Uh, if anybody is interested in joining us and in helping us uh, being part of the planning committee, uh, just seen and unseen one at gmail.com. Uh, I would like to go ahead and we have just a few minutes left. If we could have um, uh, just cl any closing remarks. Neftali, you want to go first? Yeah, just, you know, thank you everybody for um, planning and putting this together. Definitely thank you to Dr. Espinoza, um, uh, Mr. Hector, and, you know, Dr. Lucia Vasquez, and as well as all the tech for being able to have us students, you know, come together to not only watch this film and providing the film necessities for a lot of students at Redwood to watch it, you know, on their own time. Um, I did have a lot of students comment um, from the club texting me personally saying to make sure to say thank you to you guys as well because they were able to watch it with their families and with their friends and it was really something new and eye-opening during this pandemic to have a little film to watch you know since we haven't really been able to do much this year great thank you so much and remember you we can still see the film until the 30th so anybody that's out there uh, our wonderful tech guy is going to put the registration form again in the chat so that you can do that and and uh by this evening i'll get you the link uh i'm gonna just hop around if that's okay uh uh who's who's next there asap you want to go ahead and go there any comments yeah sure i just want to say thank you lucia for providing the film and sharing it with so many people allowing for us to watch it i mean i probably wouldn't have been able to see or have known about it without you uh providing us with the link and i want to say thank you again to dr paul espinoza for making the film and like kind of showing his life and his effect on the community and showing his music it was really impactful and really eye-opening so thank you to both of you for that Great, thank you. Uh, Camriel, you have any last comments? Um, just again, thank you for just the dedication and the like want and the passion towards this topic. You can just tell that um, Dr. Espinosa, you just have a passion for this and it's really good to know that like it's still occurring on all levels. And I personally would not have been exposed to this film if it had not been introduced to me. And I'm really grateful that I was able to see this film, share it with my family. And even like, even after the fact, I'll still sit back and think like, wow, like we're really able to express ourselves through music, express ourselves through activism and know that change will occur. And it's really great to see that it's happening on all levels. Great, thank you so much. Sophia? 
Um, again, like everyone said, thank you so much for this wonderful experience. Um, it was amazing and completely captivating to witness not only the beauty of music and the significance of music, but also the power of you know people and passion, how much of an impact that can generate on our society. And like Lucia said, if you haven't seen it, please do watch the film. You have to, it is beautiful. Um, it is, I believe it's up until the 30th. So please go ahead and watch it if you haven't already. Great, thank you, Javier. Sorry, my internet keeps going back and forth, but I just wanna say thank you to Dr. Lucia Vasquez and Dr. Paul Spinoza for um, making this film, making it possible for everyone to view it. Um, definitely had a lot of connections and gained a lot of insight um, on the Chicano movement and Chicano music as a whole. And, you know, after this, I definitely want to explore more and uh, hearing, you know, different songs, just exploring different artists relating to the movement or just relating to myself and the culture as a whole. Um, so I just want to thank you guys for all that you're doing. Great, thank you. And, you know, we wanted to do a thing on Chicano literature and one on Chicano music and lots of stuff. And I don't know we're going to be able to get to that right away. But uh, again, if you'd like to get involved, I don't want to have to pick on these same students all the time to come and be panelists. So we, we welcome, uh, uh, you know, tell your friends uh, and, and seen and unseen one at gmail.com. Hector, do you want to do a closing uh, remark before I give it over to Paul to say goodbye? I just wanted to thank Paul, Dr. Dr. Espinosa. It was an amazing uh, documentary. They really showed the life of someone that had amazing talent and, and ga gave to his community. I mean, it, it really inspired me. A lot of us are still in the trenches writing and, you know, we're not doing it to be famous. We do it because we, we feel we have a calling to write. And I really do want to thank you for that, um, that you were able to highlight at least one of us. Um, I also want to let anybody and everybody know that we are working, Lucia and I are working on a uh, workshop for uh, becoming an activist songwriter. Uh, like I said, I've been writing since I was uh, 13. And um, so we'll be presenting something like that in the near future. But definitely, if you have some comments, please reach out to Lucia and let her know. Uh, we're going to try to do something that's going to be uh, throughout several weeks, not just a one, one week thing, but something that's going to assist in uh, finding out what it is to be a songwriter, uh, an activist songwriter, and to be able to compose. And then hopefully by the end, everybody will have at least one composition that would be able to show off to the community. So um, it continues. Uh, Chunky's uh, heritage continues in all of us. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Hector. Uh, uh, and uh, Paul, before I give you for the last words, I just want to make sure I don't forget my committee has been wonderful. My planning committee, we've been meeting for over a year. Thank you to our Zoom master for today. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, Guspo, also known as Justin Stein, that did all our tech for us today. So again, thank you. Amy uh, has been just uh, really working hard on this. Amy Rangel as well. So also all to my committee, thank you very much. And Dr. Spinoza, thank you so much for, for all your insights and, and your comments today. Would you like to say goodbye or have uh, closing comments for us. Yeah, uh, well, just to, just briefly, Lucia, thank you so much for making this happen. I know we, we talked uh, now quite a few years ago to, to make this happen. So I'm really happy that uh, you were able to make it happen as well as you know gather all these students and other community people together to, to really see the film and encourage them to see the film. Again, just as a little commercial, uh, as several people have said, the film is still there until the end of this week. So if you know people that you think would be interested, uh, the the, the link is still there. So please uh, spread the word to anybody you think would be interested. It's really a great opportunity to see the film. So I really appreciate that. I really appreciate all the comments from the students. Thank you all for participating, the ones who participated on the committee and had some really insightful questions and comments about the film. I really appreciate hearing from all of you. And again, Hector, wonderful music. I really respect the work that you're doing. So hopefully we can, you know, maybe sometime in the future when COVID's over, we can plan a live event and, and do this again. I'd love to do that. So thank you, Lucia, for making this happen. <laughs> Sorry, I'm having trouble here with my little computer. Uh, we're going to go ahead and let uh, Hector close and oh. do a couple of songs for us. If you're ready, Hector. Yeah. I think that would that would be great. We have we have some time. So this is a little fun one called Tacos and Burritos. Burritos. Should make me happy tonight. Tacos. Eat churritos. Can I have just one more bite? When I go to Taco Bell, I always ask for 
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all so much. Thank you, everybody that joined us. Remember, we'll be on Facebook Live if you missed it. Uh, tell your friends. And uh, I'd love to, to, to hear from you. Thank you so much.